we have um, a guy who's, <laughs> who's running a, a cafe called Colonna and Smalls in, in Bath in the UK. He is three-time UK barista champion and three-time world barista championships finalist. He's currently focused in opening a grocery and also uh, just published a book about water. And that's going to be our topic today. So please welcome Maxwell Colonna Dashwood. Hello. Um, it's just going to be me speaking, because you get a whole dose of Chris tomorrow. But we're both going to do the Q&A with you. So um, yeah, water, that's what I'm here to talk about. Before we talk about the science of water, uh, I'd like to give water some context. So I think everybody agrees that water is important. It's closer to me. Thanks, Chris. Um, right here. Nice. Further. So um, everyone knows water matters, and it's not a hard argument to make. But it's also something that goes away from our thinking about coffee quite easily. And we worry about everything else, everything that's right in front of us. And that, that makes sense. I'll give you an example. Uh, like Carlo said, we've got a coffee shop in Bath called Colonna and & Smalls, and we have a brew bar. And I still do shifts on the brew bar, which I enjoy. And the whole idea of a brew bar, I think, um, is to showcase filter coffee as something valuable and interesting, and to make a bit of a show and theatre out of it. And this is good, because people will maybe think twice about what they think a filter coffee could taste like. But there's also a problem, which is they see a siphon, for example, and it's bubbling away and it's pretty, and they naturally ask about that process. They say, oh, that looks amazing. What does it do? And on one hand, I want to say to them, this is what it does and this is how it works, but I think I'll be misleading them. They'll go away thinking that the reason that coffee tasted the way it did was because of this contraption with a big halogen light. And so I like to introduce them first to an illusory pie chart um, today, I can actually show you the pie chart because I have this behind me. Um, and in that pie chart, I wanted to allocate a slice for each impactor on the way coffee tastes. And the bigger the slice, the bigger the impact it has on the way the coffee tastes. Now, I appreciate that we could argue about this for a long time, um, but just go with me. The biggest slice is, of course, the origin of the coffee. Everything that happens at a farm level. So the Soil, the climate for the year, the choice of variety, the way they approach processing, so on and so forth. Then we've got water and roast. And last of all, the smallest slice is the brewing. That's the slice the customer is asking me about. Now, for each of these slices, we talk in depth about what they are and how they work. And we're always learning more and more about it. And we definitely know more about each of these slices than we ever did before, and we're still learning. But just think about the complexity at which we talk about origin. Whether we talk about you know, the soil that was used or the way we process the coffee. And then brewing, whether we talk about a refractometer or we talk about a grind distribution profile. And then with roast, we're beginning to talk more and more about roast in detail. But what do we really say about water? How often do we really discuss it? And it's a big slice. So I'll tell you, um, this whole project started for me about two to three years ago. Uh, with an experience. Now, everybody, like I said at the beginning, knew water was important, and it would pop up in conversation regularly, especially with um, very particular circumstances, and that's when we're sharing coffee. Now, as a multi-roaster, I'm kind of sharing coffee all the time. I'm buying coffee from people, not just in the UK, but all over the world, and um, I want to talk to them about it. And you know, this dialogue that we have in the coffee community is so valuable, and it's that very dialogue that highlighted the water problem. So what happened was I bought this coffee, and we started to dial it in, focusing heavily on that little brewing window. And um, it didn't taste very good. Uh, in fact, it tasted pretty rubbish. Um, and so we were at a loss of what to do. And it got to the point where I thought, OK, I need to send this back to the roaster, and I need to talk to them about, about this problem. There must be a problem there, end. It, you know, it can't be us. Um, so I sent it back to them. And a couple of days later, they phoned me back, and they said, oh, it's very, very strange. We're really, really happy with it. We don't see what the problem is. And so I was scratching my head, and you know, we both trusted each other's judgment. We've tasted coffee together. We kind of know what kind of taster set it we're going for. And 
one of the people from that company said something very profound to me, which really sort of drove me on to try and pursue water. Is he said, water unnerves him. Because the water can impact the flavor of the coffee so much, and water is so subtly different everywhere around the world, what is the true character of any given coffee? Good question. And good questions is what we need. That's where we start. But we need to be able to answer those questions. So how do we do that? And that's where I needed to collaborate with someone. Now, Bath uh, is a pretty cool place. It's got my shops in it. Uh, it's, got, <laughs> it's got some very pretty buildings, lots of tourism, modern tech industry, and it also has a university where the gentleman in the front row, Christopher H. Hendon, was finishing up his PhD in computational chemistry. Now, when I met Chris, I didn't know what that meant. Uh, it means you use big supercomputers to create models or predictions, and then you test them to try and find out truths about the world we live in. So it's pretty cool. And so when I had this problem, I thought, well, there's no better person to ask, really. So he wandered in uh, on a weekday morning, hungover, as usual. And at the time, Chris was an avid coffee drinker, but he wasn't really into coffee, so to speak. And so I said to him, I've got some questions for you, Chris, about water. And I showed him a little device. Now, most of the time when I pop around the world or uh, have an email with someone about water, the conversation obviously needs to start somewhere. So we say, oh, what's your water like? It's probably not the best place to start, but they'll often give me a number. They'll say, oh, my water's 80, or mine's 150. And what people are referring to is something called TDS, or Total Dissolved Solids. The idea is that pure H2O has nothing dissolved in it. It's just pure H2O. But it picks up minerals um, as it makes its way around the world. And most of the water that we drink, or we used to brew coffee with, has some dissolved minerals in it. And there's this little kit called an ionic conductivity meter. It has two little probes. And based on the movement, the conductivity between those probes, we can come up with a number for how much minerals we think there are in the water. The problem I had is that, that coffee that tasted really bad from London, my probe gave a pretty similar reading to their probe. And so the next logical question was, but what are those parts made of? If it's 150, what are those 150 parts? And even if we can find out what those 150 parts are, how do we then predict what they're going to make the coffee taste like once we know what they are? And there began this collaboration. This became a discussion that turned into a proper project, and we went up to the lab, and we tested some water. And we very quickly realized that two things were going to happen. I was going to learn a lot more about chemistry, and Chris was going to learn a lot more about coffee, which I think we've done, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> And, but more than that, we needed to step away from coffee for a second and look at water science. We needed to understand the science of water before we could understand what it did to coffee. And for me, the holy grail at the beginning was could we end up in a place where we can have a predictive graph, where once we know the mineral content, we can predict the characteristics, the rough characteristics of the coffee. And um, we've got there, I think, which is um, something that has been amazing for us and uh, it's a real achievement. And there's always more to learn, but I think there's been a real shift in how we think about water for coffee. And so how do we need to think about it? So those minerals. Calcium and magnesium are the two minerals we care about. Now, there's lots of other minerals that tend to be in water to balance out the water. We tend to have nitrates, phosphates, maybe some potassium, all these bits and bobs. And one of the tests Chris did on one of these big supercomputers, it's got a name, hasn't it? Which computer did you use? It's called Archer. Sounds good, right? And um, so we looked at the binding energy of these minerals. Now, what we were doing here is we were testing a concept that was already very well sort of taken. We, we all agreed that we needed some minerals in the water to help extract flavor. That was agreed by everybody in the industry. And so we were basically looking at that concept in more depth, which minerals extract in which way. And the truth is, most of them don't do anything. They don't extract any differently to the water would do on its own. Sodium, for example, has exactly the same extraction potential as just the water. So the only time sodium would impact the brewers if you had so much you tasted it. But calcium and magnesium are really interesting because they had really strong binding energy. This basically means that water with those minerals in will extract more and different flavor than water without those in. 
Furthermore, it was very interesting to see that between the two minerals, we had slightly different sort of preferences, if you like. Uh, magnesium wanting to bite, bind to lighter, from a flavor point of view, more slightly zesty and acidic flavors, possibly. But the take-home take -home message is that they both pull a lot out of the coffee, and they both do a very good job at extracting. So the next bit that didn't make sense to us was full or hard water. The other thing I got told very early on when I was um, learning about water was that the reason we don't want high TDS water is because the water's full. So there's no room to extract flavor from the coffee. Um, this is definitely not true. Obviously, if the minerals pull flavor out, then the more minerals are there, the more stuff we should pull out. And you need to put a lot of minerals in water before you hit a saturation point. So that's not what's happening. But at the same time, anybody who's tasted a coffee made with hard water, they'll notice that it doesn't taste big, bold, complex, acidic, and vibrant. It actually tastes really flat, really dull. And you can see where that correlation came from, that thought process of the water being full. But actually, something else was happening. And this is when the whole theory came together, is when you start to consider bicarbonate in water. Now, bicarbonate on its own is a, an alkaline compound, but it has this amazing job. It's what we call a buffering system. Now, nearly all liquids or solutions on planet Earth have some form of buffering system. The idea is to try and maintain a constant pH. That doesn't necessarily mean a pH of seven, just a constant pH. And a great example is human blood. So our pH likes, in our blood likes to sit between 7.25 and 7.45. Now, the problem is, if a load of acid makes its way into that system, it's going to push the pH down. And that's a problem. We might die. We don't want that to happen. So <laughs> yeah, we can all agree on that. Yeah. Um, and so the buffer's job is to stop that happening. And it does this in the most amazing way. So most compounds, whether they're acidic or alkaline, have something called a conjugate partner. Uh, I've always liked to describe this as sort of like the evil twin or the alter ego. So if you take uh, citric acid, for example, and it's just going about day to day, doing what it does, it's an acid. If you knock the proton off it, it's still citric acid, but it's the alkaline form of citric acid. It's pretty cool, really. And so once you understand that, you can understand why hard water tastes so flat. Coffee is a mildly acidic beverage. A lot of the specialty coffees that we buy tend to have acidity around five. So you've got this water, and let's say it starts, on average, most drinking water between 6.8 and 8 on the pH scale. And then you've got these minerals in there, these calcium and magnesium, and they pull all these flavors out of the coffee, and they pull out a lot of acid. But the bicarbonate's like, well, hang on a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the pH is dropping, and we don't want that to happen. This isn't good. So it turns those flavors into their alkaline counterparts. And that's where that dull taste is coming from. The acid is in the drink. It's just organized in a way where we cannot taste them. And this is a really key uh, idea that we need to think about when we think about water for coffee. Once you make the cup of coffee, you cannot taste the water anymore. So I think it's, it's quite natural for somebody to live in an area where they've got nice drinking water. It comes from a very pure source. They really enjoy the way it tastes. And they assume, OK, I've got really nice water. I'll buy some really nice coffee, and it's going to taste really nice. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, unfortunately, that would be easier for everyone. So take Evian, for example. I really enjoy Evian, and I grew up in a very hard water area. And a lot of preferences for drinking water can be traced. There's a correlation with where you grew up and what you're used to. It makes atrocious coffee, Evian. Uh, on the flip side, I'm going to show you some waters now that I think make really good coffee, and I don't like drinking those waters. Cool. So the characters that I've just told you about, the calcium and magnesium and the bicarbonate, are charted on this graph. Up the vertical axes, we have calcium and magnesium as a joint entity. Uh, now, you quite rightly may be thinking, well, don't they do slightly different things? Why aren't they separated? Um, in, in general, it, you can look into that if you wish, but because they do a very similar job, it's very valuable to talk about them like this. And so what that means is, as the amount of calcium and magnesium go up, we extract more flavor out of the coffee, predominantly more acid. Along the bottom, we've got the buffer, who is doing a very different job. As the buffer goes up, we've got more ability to neutralize the acid in the coffee. 
And what this means is if we know the amount of each of these, we can chart our water on this graph and we have an idea of how it's going to make the coffee taste. So, for example, where's the little pointer? Which one is it? The star one. Nice. So, down the bottom left here, very, very soft water. We've got no minerals to pull flavor out, so it's quite empty, not very complex. We also have no buffer at all. So even though the buffer can be a big problem for us, we do need a little bit of it around to help us balance the cup. Then over on the bottom right-hand side, we have got um, lots of buffer, but no flavor-pulling ability. So it's going to taste quite flat, it's going to taste empty, but with none of the sourness that the first cup had. Top right, which I think is the source water here. That's the water you're starting with at the tap here in Italy, in this part of Italy. Obviously, it changes a lot as you move around. So at the top right, we've got loads of both. We're pulling out loads and loads of flavor with calcium magnesium, but we're wiping it all out with the carbonate hardness. What's interesting about this is you have to use this graph with a given coffee. Because the next thing I'm going to talk about is basically the spanner in the works, and that's roasting. All coffee around the world, whether the roaster realizes it or not, is roasted to a given water. They buy some green coffee, they roast it. They cup it, and they go, oh, maybe it's a little bit sour, a bit flat, a bit this, so on and so forth. Ultimately, that whole process is them tailoring that coffee to taste as good as it possibly can with the water that they cup with. And that's a problem because it means, let's take a soft water area, for example, empty, sharp, and sour. You will often find that if you then tasted those roasts up here somewhere, they're going to taste pretty roasty. What's happening is they're compensating for their water. So they need to make the coffee more soluble because they haven't got the minerals to pull flavor out. And they also need to basically tame some of that unpleasant acidity. And this is a problem because that dialogue I was talking about at the beginning we are, it's very much a global community that we have, and this is a good thing. But it's, it makes water very, very worrying because we'll say, you know, everyone's had a coffee from a friend from a different country or a different roaster that they were very excited about. They heard great things about the roaster and they thought, I can't wait to taste this. And then they're like, hmm, this is not very good, a bit rubbish, a bit of a letdown. Now, I'm not saying that it was definitely the water, but you'd be surprised how often it is the water. And there's one, um, there's one story that I really like to tell about um, two different companies. So Phil and Sebastian are a roastery in Calgary, in Canada. And they've been going for about five, six years, I think. And they were engineers. And they got into coffee after visiting Tim Wendelbo in Oslo, in Norway. And they loved these aromatic, crisp, fruity, bright coffees, clean, slightly lighter body, possibly. And they wanted to bring that to Canada, because there wasn't a lot of that going on. They wanted to get into sourcing better coffees, so on and so forth. So they went away and they did this, and they were very successful, and they still are. They had several barista champions from their business uh, in a row. And it came, there came an opportunity for Phil and Seb to go back and visit Tim in Oslo. And they brought their coffees, and they did a blind tasting. And they went around the table, and they were like, oh, these, it was blind. They didn't know which ones were theirs. They were like, oh, these coffees aren't very good. And <laughs> Then they turn the cards over, they're like, oh, fuck. That's, <laughs> that's our coffee. <laughs> and so to, uh, he actually confessed to me, Phil, that he had a sleepless night after that. He felt embarrassed, you know, because he was really proud to show these coffees to Tim. And ultimately, he was looking for a very similar taste profile in the cup. And he went away and um, thought about it quite a lot. And then I bumped into Phil in Rimini at the World Championships, where my whole routine was about water. And we had a little chat about it. And what was coming up that year was a gastronomic event called Mad Symposium, um, run by René Redzepi, who's a very famous chef uh, who, own, who runs Noma in Copenhagen. And the idea is that you've got amazing food and drink people at this event, and they have a coffee service. And any, anyone from around the world can send their coffee in to be blind cupped, and they'll choose the best coffees to be presented at the festival. And so obviously, Phil was a little bit burnt from his previous experience. But he also said to me, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the water. It's got to be the water. And then he went back to Calgary, and he did something that was very clever, which I've now stolen and done today for you. Um, he made the water from scratch. So he went and bought some deionized or distilled water from a supermarket, 
or you can get them in different places. And the idea is that's water with no minerals in it whatsoever. He then went and bought some mineral salts. Um, they're really easy to get. They look really dodgy. People are always like, oh, where'd you get those? But, <laughs> but you can just get them on eBay. <laughs> and um, he got in touch with Tim, and you know, this is what's so great about the coffee industry, is when I started this project with Chris, everyone was so giving with information and their experiences, and we couldn't do it without all of that collaboration. And so he found out what that water was they were going to cup it with. He went and made that water, and he then took his favorite coffee that um, he was most proud of, and he roasted it just to that water. He was cupping with that water, nothing else. And then he sent the coffee off to the festival, and it tasted crap. I'm just joking. It tasted amazing. <laughs> and, the co <laughs> and the coffee was chosen to be presented at Mad Symposium. But just think about this. What a turnaround. Phil's going for exactly the same flavor in the cup. And one moment, it's seen as one of the worst coffees on the table, and the next, it's chosen for the event. And so these are all the things that we have to consider as a community. And you know, me and Chris have we've written this book, which you can buy. And <laughs> but the idea of the book is to help with that communication, with that dialogue, with that language. And, but what does this mean? A lot of people quite quickly think, OK, so what's the perfect water? That's not, that's not really where we wanted to go with this. I mean, on the one hand, I get that, and I, and I, I like that idea. When I was doing a talk in America last year, they said, oh, why don't you talk about the idea of water terroir? I was like, oh, that's, that's a really good idea. And I went away and thought about it. And what they mean is the, higher? Damn. Should I start again? How long have I been doing that? Yeah. <laughs> um, what they mean is that all the different waters around the world in different locations play into the rich tapestry that is the world of coffee. And that that's part of what makes coffee so, taste so different and so complex. And I can see this idea, and it's quite a romantic idea, but uh, it's also, yeah, I just, I don't, think, I don't think we should embrace that. I don't think that's necessarily a positive thing. The idea is that we want to taste the terroir of the coffee. Ideally, it makes sense to try and standardize water so we can focus on the coffee itself. But that's also very hard to do, as Sergio will attest to. Um, it's easier to say, let's standardize water than it is to actually go and do it. Um, it's actually quite hard to build water, so to speak, and especially to do it on a commercial level and to do it consistently and so on and so forth. It's easy for me to do it here for, you know, but you wouldn't want to do it in a store. Um, and different filtration solutions out there at the moment have different benefits, but they're all fixed systems. So if you take something like our reverse osmosis, for example, it effectively, it's very clever technology. It's very hard to get all the minerals out of water, but it also conceptually does a very simple thing. It basically just dilutes your water. So with RO, you basically, let's say you start up here. As you make it softer, you come down on a straight line. You literally just get a linear relationship, just less or more of the same stuff. But you're not controlling what that stuff is. So you know, you'll do a cupping, for example, and you'll make waters. And you'll go, oh, we made a 50 ppm, we made 100 ppm, we made 150, and we went and cupped them. And we think 50 is best, therefore 50 is the ultimate water. But that 50 ppm was best with their water through the RO system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so the idea is we have created a tasting for you. Um, we're going to do a Q&A now, but I'll just explain the tasting quickly. I'm going to give you the same coffee brewed with three different waters. Each blue dot represents the water we used. And I'm not going to tell you which one's which at the moment, but they're labeled A, B, C. And I'd like you to taste them in that order if you can. So taste A, B, C, and then you can go back to them as many times as you like. But I think that's the best order to start with. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to see how everybody gets on with that. And in the meantime, we should do a Q and A. Amazing, thank you. So questions? Yeah. Come up. Andrew? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was wondering if, uh, if, you, if, if the water you use with the process of cleaning coffee already, if it uh, has an impact, you mean during the processing? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Fascinating. Yeah. If it if it makes a real difference if you use the during the processing certain, method, certain water in the yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. Fascinating idea. Would love to explore it. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's going to be my answer for every question. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, with your roastery, how are you going to roast coffees for different waters? Yeah, good question. Next question. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very good question. And I was recently um, lucky enough to give a talk in Canada, and, next, and George Howe was speaking after me. Uh, uh, yeah, he's an amazing person, coffee person. And I was talking to him about, he got some perfect water from a company called Circa in the States. And they've been building wor water for quite a few years. And he tested it with his coffee and he said, I don't get the fuss, it just flattened my coffee out. And I explained to him that that's because his coffee is roasted to his water. And you could see the penny drop. And he was like, oh no, what am I gonna do? Like eight roasts? Are you gonna send me your water and then I'm gonna roast the coffee to your water? Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll steal that idea as well. So the <laughs> Um, I think what we'll do is we will definitely consider not roasting for every single water, of course, it's a ridiculous idea, but take Britta, for example, a uh, water manufacturer. In the UK, most of their sales are actually little home water jugs, which filters your water a lot like a cartridge would. And because, of course, water changes all over Europe and it changes all over Asia, but because there's a statistically significant general difference between Asia and Europe. They actually create two different water jugs for each part of the world. So my thought process is maybe let's do a soft water. Let's roast a coffee to a soft water. Now, soft water is not, in my opinion, ideal, but it's easily achievable. Anybody can go pick up soft water anywhere, or you can make it quite easily. So it's definitely the most easily standardized water. So we could do a soft water, and then we could roast one to what we see is a premium water. Um, but then I, have an, uh, I do start to worry then about education, which is the consumer. So I say, oh, this is for a medium, ideal, slightly harder water. And they're like, so it's for hard water? Great. And then, they, and then they walk off and make it with hard water and go, oh, it tastes rubbish. So there is that problem. If you start that dialogue, it's much easier to say, this is the coffee. This is how we think it's roasted perfectly. End of story. So it may open up a can of worms, but it also makes sense to try and do that. Yeah. Have you got? No, not a lot. No. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. But uh, if if we go back to that first story where I had that coffee that tasted crap, um, I couldn't do anything with my brew window. Like it's um the brew window is definitely. If, if you've got a coffee that doesn't match that water or water that doesn't match that coffee, whichever way you look at it, you're kind of, yeah, you're, you're buggered, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it's, I don't, I don't, yeah. if the water is really soft, you're gonna, if you have soft water and you've got a coffee roasted in soft water, and then you put it with hard water, you're just going to extract a whole bunch. So then what people end up doing, right, is yeah, they can <laughs> Yeah, you like could, it. yeah. And then if it's roasted for hard water and you have soft water, then you have this other problem where you can't extract all the stuff in the coffee, so it always tastes under. Tastes underdeveloped, right. yeah. So, so that's, that's more or less the position you're in. It doesn't really matter how fine you grind it. You're never gonna I th yeah, I think you can make it, like Chris is saying, you can make an adjustment to make it a bit better, mm -hmm. than, but you're never going to be to the point where, you, where you're happy with the brew, basically. Yeah. Anyone else? Do this stuff change when you boil water? Like, yeah, you mean yeah, you, you mean the composition? Tank. Very, very, very slight. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, can you use the mic so we can get it on the on the video? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you boil water, uh, the solubility of calcium carbonate, so lime scale, decreases, so it crystallizes, uh, and that's why in your kettle you'll find sometimes you find a deposition of lime scale, but if you boil water once, you don't immediately find crystals forming. It's a, it's a process. So assuming that your espresso machine or your kettle or whatever has water just heated up and then you use it, those minerals are still soluble. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, Tibor has a question. It's, it's uh, kind of uh, building on that. What about water that's sitting in a boiler uh, like at 93 degrees for hours, what happens? Yeah. Yeah, the, the steam boiler would be more problematic at the higher temperatures. 
the than the ninety three. But yeah. So one of the things that happens is uh, actually George Halligan. I was just over there to visit him, and uh, he had a, a steam boiler that had a tap on it uh, where you could dispense hot water out of it. And at the tip of the tap, there was a lime scale deposition. And I think a lot of people have seen this before. And the origin of that is that actually, if you think about what's happening at that tip, it's actively heated. So water is coming through and then getting stuck on the edge. And so the concentration of, of, carbon, uh, of calcium and, and uh, bicarbonate is very high relative to the rest of the liquid because it's constantly being concentrated on the tip. So you do see lime scale on the tip of the boiler, but sometimes not on the inside. But if it's actively heated, yeah, the solubility does decrease. Yeah, I mean, it's going it to it take a long time, wouldn't it? You'd have to, you'd have to heat it a lot. Um, but yeah, over time, with continual heating, you will deposit. But the thing is, the, the, carb, the bicarb at the bottom there, if you don't have any of that, the calcium won't deposit. Um, so basically, if the calcium is dissolved into the water, then it's not calcium carbonate. It's the calcium. And you need a carbonate for it to become calcium carbonate. So... It depends, different waters are going to act more severely based upon heating. So water with quite a lot of uh, carbonate hardness is going to deposit really, really quickly. So if you preferred a water like that, great, but then you might have more problems with uh, scale. So just to build on that, actually, just one point. Uh, I'm pretty negative towards the ionic conductivity probe. I don't know if everybody knows that, but it's definitely a public thing. Uh, but if you heat up, if you start with your tap water or filtered water and you stick your probe in there and it reads a number, whatever it means, and then you heat your water up and then let it cool back down and, and probe the thing again, that meter, the number is irrelevant, but it is relative to the next measurement. So if something has deposited, you would see the meter once that water's returned back down to room temperature drop in conductivity, right? So, that, so the ions would have deposited. Does that make, that make sense, I think? So I have never seen that occur. But I've only done a sample like maybe like five times just to, you know, sometimes when you, sometimes you don't have a bypass on your filter. So when I'm testing somebody's water in a shop, I walk in there with my kit ready to do it and there it's all hot, right? And I, so I can't do any of these measurements. I have to do it at room temperature. So I, I end up going out of the, this, what do you call that thing? Out of, no, out of the espresso machine with the, the, the one that drops water out of the espresso machine. The water... <laughs> I'm, so, uh, I'm still learning coffee, whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about, the thing with the hot water. You wait for it to cool down. That's the point. Okay, yeah, and, I, and, the, and the conductivity is, is the same. The drops read the same, but that's, you know, one sample, and there's probably a lot of water flowing around, so. Yeah, yeah, if, if, you're, if, you're, going, if you're cycling through water at, at like, an, you know, a medium, busy cafe would, it's not going to be a concern. It would have to be continually heated for a long, long time. All right, more questions there. When you don't have a professor nearby, how do you test these things? What is the best way to test this in a cafe? Very good question. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, basically, obviously the conductivity meter was quite simple to buy and it was very easy to get hold of and it became, lots of people used it, very prolific. Um, drop test kits, titration test kits, um, very, very, they're used a lot in aquariums, swimming pools, or that kind of thing. Um, do you want to explain the science of a titration test kit? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, so these titration test kits, essentially you add, for let's say we're, we're looking for calcium, if you want to quantify calcium, you add a molecule to the water that grabs onto calcium. So anybody who's ever heard of somebody who's had heavy metal poisoning, it's the same molecule, it's EDTA, and its job is to go around and find metals and then grab onto them like a glove and so that they, and then they, you know, drift off and just float around. But the idea is, is that you add EDTA to a solution that contains calcium, magnesium, whatnot, and it grabs onto all the calcium. And eventually, when one, when all the calcium has been collected, that you observe a color change. And so, based on the amount of drops you've added to, essentially sequester the calcium, you then will be able to say one drop is equal to 15 ppm or whatever. Now there is. A concern that the units, so you have to check which units the, these drops are in, right? It could be measured in calcium ions or it could be measured relative to calcium carbonate, which is what a lot of people uh, 
a lot of the drops are and a lot of the aquarium stuff is. It could also be measured uh, to something else, like gr grains, and then you have to do a conversion from grains to calcium, which is like, what, 17.1? Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's all on. That's all should be contained in these kits. But the kits are really cheap. Now, having said all this, as of last week, we discovered a kit that does separate magnesium and calcium, and also does bicarbonate as well. And this kit is really, really clever. So it acknowledges that calcium. The way you'd measure calcium traditionally is with EDTA. But EDTA grabs onto iron. And where is Cali? Is he here? There you are. Cali has a shop, and in his shop, he has lots of iron too dissolved in his water which is very unusual, but it's, it's what he has. And if you add EDTA to that water, EDTA will grab onto iron too, as well as calcium, and that's a big problem. So what this test does is it totally saturates the liquid with EDTA, so it grabs everything. And then is, has a method of freeing calcium as opposed to gr collecting calcium. So then it's selective for calcium going backwards, so it's liberating it. So that's a really clever way of doing the calcium test. The magnesium one's much more selective, so the magnesium test is just for magnesium. And, and then the bicarbonate is a simple acid-base titration. So the, the, uh, the acidity or basicity of bicarbonate is well known in water at room temperature. And so you just do a, you add acid, and essentially when you see a pH swing, that's when the color changes. Uh, I, I think the name of that kit, for those who are interested, that, the name of that kit is it's by a, an aquatic company called Red Sea. I found it on eBay the other day, and it's like f it was like 50 US dollars, so I don't know what that converts to for you guys. How much did you pay? Who knows? Okay. Yeah, anyway, so I actually haven't had a full experience with this yet, so I can't speak to it, but it looks like it does a pretty good job. Great. Uh, okay, we have... Is, is all the coffee out in the cups? The coffee is out now, so I think we're going to wrap it up. All right. Now we can. Yeah, we're around. So just yeah, talk to us. Yeah. So just uh, grab these two gentlemen and, and ask them more questions. Yeah, my, my water is, is kind of messy. Uh, so we've been struggling with that a bit. But now, uh, thank you so much, Chris and Maxwell. <laughs>